<laughs> so, uh, so okay. So, am I taking off now? Yep. Yes, you're already long. You're long. Well, just even what we've just been kind of talking about here makes me think of uh, what Paul wrote to the Galatians. You know, if we walk by the Spirit, then we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so, you know, we spend so much time, you know, on don't do this and we shouldn't do that. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, the old old uh, program, you know, don't do drugs, you know. You can't not do something. You have to do something else. And uh, the more you think about what it is you don't want to do, then that's what you're thinking about. And so walking by the Spirit is, is the antidote to to fulfilling the flesh. In other words, if we walk by the Spirit, then then we're doing something other than uh, fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And so that's why it's so important for us to to really tap into the Spirit and let Him lead, even when we don't recognize necessarily that it is, like in my story I just shared, allowing Him to lead, even when you're not uh, at the level of, let's say, following an angel or following a, you know, a, uh, revelation when it's just a little unction it's that little not even a still small voice it's even it's even less than that you can feel that tug and you don't know why but you just feel like it is that's what you're supposed to do or that's what you're supposed to say and how many times that can lead to a, something supernatural you know so anyway that's something good so when it comes to tonight what I'm going to talk to you about is um is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in the first few verses there. And I talk about the different gifts uh, and the different categories of gifts that are listed there. And, you know, when it comes to the Word of God, I'm a student of the Word. Uh, you know, years ago uh, in our pastors association here in Missoula, which we went from, uh, you know, just a, a pastors association for all, all church leaders, and then we went to uh, one for evangelical church leaders to or, or pastors to one that was open to any uh, fivefold ministry, basically. Uh, so over the years, we we adapted and changed. But I remember years ago, what's that? Go ahead. That was just electronic. Oh, okay. So I remember years ago we were we were talking one time, and there was a uh, one of the pastors who was really. Uh, he was Church of God, and he was really, uh, you know, a Word guy. And uh, we differed on a number of things when it came to the things of the Spirit. And I learned a lot from him because I learned a lot about sometimes he'd get upset about things, and I couldn't understand why. And then over time, you know, we'd have lunch together, we'd talk. And I realized it was so much of it was communication. It was a, it was terminology. Like I would – we did a conference one time called um, – uh, Let's see, your spiritual authority. And he got so upset about that. And I couldn't understand why you'd be upset about something about your spiritual authority. When I realized what he was, when I finally understood what he was saying, he, he thought we were talking about spiritual authority that you have outside of Christ. So once I understood his, he wasn't catching it. So we just called it your spiritual authority in Christ. And then he was like, oh, oh, okay. Well, we just assume you knew that. So little things like that. But one time we were talking, and I remember uh, telling him, he said, you know, the other pastors see us as two extremes. They see you as the word guy. They see me as the spirit guy. And personally, I see myself as a word guy, too. But I'm just saying this is the way they see it. And he said, really? And I said, yeah. He goes, you know, and, and I was surprised and, and encouraged by his response. He said, wow, if that's the case, then you and I need to even work harder, you know, at, at making sure everybody knows we're getting along and we're, we're working together. And after that, you know, we started having going out to lunch together and everything and really got to know each other a lot better. But, you know, there's, there, we need the spirit and the word. And, you know, I always got a, uh, one time Rick said something that really kind of shocked me, uh, <laughs> being a kind of a word guy was, was he said, if you ever get, now this isn't a direct quote, but, but it was, but basically he was saying, if you ever get stranded on a desert island, you have a choice between having the Bible or the Holy Spirit, take the Holy Spirit. You know, and I was like, wait a minute, the Bible's important, you know, and then I got to thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> would you rather have the artwork or would you rather have the artist? You know, the Bible or the, or, or the author. And the author, you know, is unlike the Quran or the Book of Mormon or any other 
religious book you might come up with, the author's still here with us. The Holy Spirit's still here with us. And so we can we have many writers in the scripture. Uh, holy men of God were moved as, as they uh, wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But it was the Holy Spirit that's the author. And so he's still here. And when we sit down with the word of God, it's just like when we walk throughout our day, we should expect and ask for the Holy Spirit to go with us. So when we study scripture, we should have the Holy Spirit with us. He is the writer. He is the author uh, of the scripture. And he didn't forget what he wrote. He didn't forget what it means. Nor did he forget what he has hidden in there. In other words, the, you know, the scripture says that um, it's the glory of God to conceal on a matter, it's the glory of uh, kings to search it out. Well, he's the one that hid it. He, and so many times, you know, he can be the one that is with us to help dig the, or shine the light on those gems that you wouldn't see otherwise. Kind of like digging in a mine. If you have a light and it hits that stone that's, you know, that gem that's in the rock, just right you can see it whereas otherwise you go right by it it's just another it's just part of the wall of the of the, of the cave or the mine so when we come to the scriptures i've learned that we need the holy spirit with us and i've had a number of times when the holy spirit either shined a light on things or i've had the lord actually speak to me at times even audibly about things that were against my doctrine things that i was taught now when <laughs> one time I prophesied something that was against my own doctrine, and I'm like, "What?" You know, and I was thinking that was it had to be a false prophecy, you know. <laughs> but it turned out the prophecy was correct. My teaching that I had received was wrong. See, because the Holy Spirit knows the Scripture, and the the true prophetic will never contradict Scripture, but it will enlighten us. For instance, think of think of Peter on top of the. Um, uh, what was it, Simon the Tanner, right? I, was, I call him the taxidermist. Uh, so he was up at the taxidermist's house up on the roof, you know, and he got a little hungry, and then all of a sudden he went into a trance, and he gets this vision of the of the sheep coming down, filled with all the animals, which I would love a, being a hunter. I'd, uh, I'd like those kind of visions, you know what I mean? But I don't have a problem with eating them, though, like Peter did. I'm like, okay, let's go get them. But uh, he had the vision, you know, and three times the spirit said, you know, rise, kill, and eat. And even though he was hungry, he was so religious, he wasn't going to do it. And he said, and the Lord said, you know, don't call that which I've called clean, unclean. And you know the story. In other words, that went against his doctrine. But did it go against scripture? As it turns out, it didn't go against scripture. There's scriptures that say, you know, I have other people. I have, Jesus said, I have other sheep. The scripture says, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. So it was against his doctrine, but it was not against the scripture. So when we have prophecies uh, or, pe or people who are considered prophets that are prophesying against scripture, it can't be the, the spirit. But on the other hand, if it's against our understanding of, the, of scripture, we need to change our understanding. But that's why we need to be like Bereans and search the scriptures to see whether these things are so, to to take these things that the Holy Spirit may bring to us. And I, I kind of use this as a, uh, I may have used this before, you know, I'm teaching, teaching uh, with the, the class here, but uh, uh, I tongue in cheek say that the Bible is in three colors. It's uh, black and red and white. And everything that God said is in black and everything that Jesus says is in red. And everything the Holy Spirit says is in white. And the only way to understand the black and the red is to learn to read between the lines. In other words, we need to have the Holy Spirit teaching us. And, you know, he's the one that kind of uses the highlighter sometimes as we read. My dad used to say, well, he, my dad studied all the different books of religion, you know, just, just to read them. And he, he wasn't ever going to become a uh, Muslim or a Buddhist, but he read the script, their scriptures and the God of the Vita and all that stuff. He said, well, you need to know what they think and you need to know uh, what you're up against. But he used to say, you know, you can read those books and you can disagree with them or whatever, but at least you read them and you understand them. You read the Book of Mormon, it's a storybook. Uh, you know, I've, you're not going to, if you got any 
wisdom, you're not going to base your life on that story, but there's, it's a story. You can understand it. You can disagree with it, but you can understand it. But the Bible is not like that. You read it, and sometimes you go, what did that mean? And then, especially if you don't have the Spirit before you get saved, it's like you definitely don't know what it means. But then, when you, even with the Spirit, you say, hmm, I wonder what that means. Or another time you say, well, I've read that verse a hundred times, and I never saw that before. Those kinds of things. That's because it's different than any other book. It's in the natural, but it's a spiritual, uh, it's, like a, it's like a ladder or a stair step into the Spirit. Even though it is not itself Spirit, it is a natural item that was left here to help bring us into or translate us into things of the spirit. And there's no other, there are books that will do that, but not in a good sense. In other words, there's other spiritual books that, you know, uh, that'll take you into demonic stuff. But uh, so we're fortunate to have the scriptures, but without the spirit, you know, like Jesus said to the Pharisees, you know, you search the scriptures because in them you, Say you have eternal life, but it's they that testify of me. And it's not there, but it's kind of like in a parenthesis, and you don't know me. <laughs> it's kind of like implied the rest of that sentence. Here I am standing here, and you haven't figured it out. So as we look at this tonight, I'm just going to share this with you. But these are things that, that the Holy Spirit, you know, highlighted to me, which is why I can teach this uh, out of uh, 1 Corinthians 12. So. So let's just read this. First Corinthians 12, I'll just read 1 through 7, 1 through 6 to start off. It says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now there's seven different things in scripture that Paul wrote. And you know, seven is a number of spiritual perfection. So when you see a number like that, there's seven different things that Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant of. So if you ever do a word study sometime, look up those seven different things that every Christian is supposed to be Another way of saying don't be ignorant is to say you should be smart. You should be smart on this subject. So concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I want you to be smart. It's one of the seven things. You know that you were Gentiles carried away by these dumb idols, however you were led. However you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And, you know, he's talking to former uh, idol worshipers. And they worship the dumb idols, meaning they don't speak. But they had demons behind them. These people understood demons. Uh, the, the folks in those days in the church in Corinth, they had had experiences with demons. It's, it's like folks in Africa, you deal with folks in Africa, you deal with people in India uh, and other places. And, and many of them have... Uh, daily encounters with demons and uh you know when you cast demons out in the church in india it's no big deal because they they all know everybody has demons and so when you cast one out it's like you just have a bigger spirit you see and then you teach them about the holy spirit but in america you know people get offended well, i don't have a demon you know and so sometimes that closes the door to their own deliverance but uh in a lot of these other cultures they they have no problem understanding that well, <clears throat> Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and explaining to them what they came out of. But one of the things that come out of is you have to understand that the devil's kingdom is not very peaceful. They don't get along. The demons and the principalities, it's kind of like the Democratic Party right now. They don't get along with each other. You know, they try to show a, a, a front against you know, Jehovah God, just like they try to have a, a front against Trump, for instance. Uh, but in reality, there's a lot of infighting going on. And so these guys were concerned that, for instance, when someone would speak in tongues, they were afraid it was a different spirit than the Holy Spirit because they didn't understand it. And they were afraid it was a different spirit that came in that was going to now uh, bring curses on Jehovah or on Jesus. And Paul was writing some of this to say, no, that's not happening. Jesus the Holy Spirit and God get along fine. They don't ever curse each other. They don't ever fight amongst themselves. And so then that's what he's laying out, laying out here. I made known to you that no one who speaks by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Can't say it in the Spirit. Now, 
Verse 4, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are diversities of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Now, one day I was reading this, and the Holy Spirit says, what, do you, what categories do you see there? And I saw a spirit, Lord, who's Jesus. So you got spirit, the Son, and, and the Father. You got three categories there in verse 4, 5, and 6. Gifts of the Spirit, gifts of the Son, and gifts of the Father. There are diversities of gifts, differences of ministries, and diversities of activities, but there are different categories of types of gifts. So I had to delve into this to, and with the Lord's help, look at these different. Now, I, I break them down into these three categories. The Spirit, uh, the, the gifts of the Spirit, we're going to read here in 1 Corinthians 12. And I call them manifestational gifts. You see that in verse 7, the manifestation of the Spirit. So these gifts, the charisma or charismata gifts, are manifestational. They're the manifestations of the gift of Holy Spirit. Then there's different ministries, but the same Lord. We'll look at those in a minute in Ephesians chapter 4. Those are the gift ministries that were sent from heaven after he sat down at the right hand of God to motivate the church, to equip the church. And I call those the motivational gifts. That's the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Those are the gifts of the Son that he gave after he ascended up on high and sat down to the right hand of God. And then there's different activities with the same God. Those are inspiration. I call them inspirational gifts that we're going to look at in Romans chapter 12. These are gifts that God gives to all his children. That doesn't mean that all children of God, meaning human beings, uh, have all these gifts, but every human being has some kind of gift from God. It, it, there's some sort of natural gift that they have that, that their Heavenly Father, now I'm not talking about they're born again, I'm just saying they were created, they're sons of Adam, uh, or as C.S. Lewis would call it, the sons and daughters of Adam. So those that were created by God, Adam was the first one that's called a son of God, uh, in the human race. And so everyone that's a descendant of Adam, in that sense, we're not sons of God through Jesus Christ, not through the adoption, but, but through the, the fact that we're created in his image makes us different from animals. Okay, of course, of course there's a lot of, uh, you know, people on the left and the eco people, you know, they want to say that animals, and you know, the Hindus, same thing, they want to say the animals and humans are not different. But we believe, Christians believe that and Jews believe that mankind was made in the image of God, three parts, spirit, soul, and body. So here we're looking at the three parts of these gifts. So, all right. So we see here in 1 Corinthians 12, different gifts called manifestations of the spirit, and there's nine of them. Nine is actually the biblical number for judgment. And it's also the biblical number for the spirit. So as we're looking at these nine here, you know, it's, it's kind of like it's emphasized uh, by that number, number nine. And the Spirit is the one that gives us judgment. So let's look at them. First Corinthians uh, chapter 12, beginning verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Another the word of knowledge through the same spirit. In other words, church and Corinth, these are not different demons. These are one spirit. It's the spirit of God. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. The New King James has the he capitalized. Other translations have the, the he in lowercase. So some people believe it's as God wills. Some people believe it's as the, human, as the believer wills. King James says, distributing severally as he wills. Uh, the Young's literal translation says, dividing to each severally as he intends. Uh, so what, what is it? Back up to verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit 
is given to each one for the profit of all. Okay, the profit of all, who are we talking to? When it, when it comes to scripture and interpreting scripture, uh, First Peter says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the, for the word of God came uh, not by the will of man, but as holy men were moved by the spirit. So it's not of any private or one's own interpretation. So then what is it? I know Paul Keith Davis likes to emphasize, well, you have to get a revelation of Scripture, and that's not bad. Uh, but there are principles of Scripture that God put in the Scripture to help us interpret the Scripture. If we'll follow the principles, for instance, the rule of first mention. It's not the law of first mention, but it's a rule of first mention. It helps us. You look at the first time a word is used in Scripture, it gives you understanding that will stick with that word from then on. For instance, the word prophet. We know that according to Jesus that um, Abel was a prophet. But the first person that was called a prophet was Abraham. We know that Enoch was a prophet. But the first person that was called a prophet is Abraham. And the verse says, you know, to, I think it's to Abimelech, Go to Abraham, he's a prophet, and he will pray for you. And you'll be, you know, you'll be protected. The interesting thing, that's also the first verse in the Bible that has the word pray in it. So the first verse in the Bible that has the word prophet is the first verse in the Bible that has the word pray. That gives us something that sticks with us throughout Scripture of, I call them fraternal twins of prayer and prophecy. If you've got a prophet that doesn't pray, he's probably not a prophet. He may or may not foretell. You know, Nathan never foretold anything. Abraham never foretold anything. But they prayed. So anyway, this, that's just an example. So another one is uh, the word all. When you read the word all, this is good for all, let's say. You know, is it all without exception or is it all with distinction? You read, uh, let's say, for instance, uh, Romans 11, and Paul is talking to the, to the Jews. So when he talks about all, he's talking about all Jews, not all people in the whole world. There's lots of verses in the Old Testament that Moses wrote. When he, and he mentions to every year to all, and he's talking about to the, to the Hebrews, not to the Gentiles. So you have to get the category correctly if you want to get it applied correctly. So you have to understand if you go back to 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it's to the church in Corinth. So we understand what he's writing to the church in Corinth is to the church. And we can apply it. If we're part of the body of Christ, we're part of the church of Christ, it can, it can apply to us. So when we start talking about the gifts of the Spirit, and he says it's, it's God who works all in all in this category, um, we're talking about all in all in the church, not in the whole world, right? The verses are, oh, excuse me, that one, that one I backed up. That one is, is the whole world. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So that verse 7, each one in the church to the profit of all in the church. That's the category. So when we're talking about here the nine gifts of the Spirit or manifestations of the gift of Holy Spirit, he divides severally or individually as he wills. Now, again, is this, the, is this as he, God, wills or he, the believer, wills? Well, I always answer it, yes. Well, uh, there's a lot of people who teach that well, each one gets one. You know, if you've got the gift of faith and you, I might have the gift of healing and Someone else has the gift of tongues, and another person has the gift of interpretation of tongues. Well, Paul said, if you speak in tongues in the church, pray that you may interpret. So obviously, he was saying, if you're going to speak in tongues, you should ask God to also interpret. So he must, you know, that's, in, that's two chapters away in 1 Corinthians 14. So he's saying, if you have one, go ahead and get another one. Go to God to get it. And then um, he also says here in uh, verse 
uh, 31 of chapter 14 says, For you all can prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be encouraged. So in other words, if he were saying in verse 11 that we each get one, and then in chapter 14 he says, we all may prophesy, then that means we only have one. Or we have the only gift we have in the church is prophecy, if we can only have one. And of course, we know that's not the case, correct? So we have to interpret this at least a little bit liberally to say, we have some say in the Lord's will to give us the gifts. We, our faith opens the door for the Lord to give us more than one or to give us any. And I kind of like to have the feeling of, why not all nine? Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to be gifted in all nine, meaning necessarily have a long suit in all nine. Does that make sense? But why can't I, if I have the same Holy Spirit as you, and if the gift is Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit that's speaking in tongues, and it's the Holy Spirit that's bringing the interpretation, then why can't I speak in tongues and interpret if you can? And if it's the Holy Spirit that, ha that manifests the healing, then why can't I manifest the healing through faith? I can through faith. Because I, I have the gift of Holy Spirit, and he manifests himself in, in these nine different ways that we call gifts or manifestations of spirit. But by faith, I access it. Now, I may have a long suit, and there are people who have long suits in, let's say, tongues. And then we'll say, well, you know, I really don't like tongues. It doesn't seem as exciting as signs and miracles. Let's do, I would rather have miracles and healings than tongues. You know what? Use what you have. Be faithful with what you have. But accept that he may, you know, accept that you can also enter into more. But don't neglect what you have on the way to uh, seeking the Lord for more. Uh, matter of fact, tongues, I did a study once on tongues, and I found there are actually more verses in Scripture that tell benefits of speaking in tongues than any other of these gifts. I found 40 different benefits of tongues. Now, I like miracles and healing. I can tell you great benefits, but there aren't that many verses about the benefits of miracles and healing. There's examples of miracles and healings. But there's not as many verses. You can build up your holy faith. There's different kinds of faith. There's natural faith. There's holy faith. There's supernatural faith. But you can build your faith by speaking in tongues. It says that in Jude. So, wow, why don't we teach those things? So anyway, so that which seems to be the least may be the more necessary. Uh, but just as an example. So let's, I'm just laying that out. You study the scriptures for yourself. If you've been taught that, you know, everybody gets one and it's according to the Holy Spirit, you know, he makes a decision. You just study. You study it for yourself and see. Because uh, like I said, Paul says, covet earnestly the best gifts, plural. What are the best gifts? I would say they're the ones you need. <laughs> and he also said, you know, we all may prophesy. So if we all may prophesy then obviously we all can at least have that one. And if it's limited to one, then that why do we have nine? So we've got to have at least two, <laughs> two apiece. So I believe we should, uh, we should have a, a trust in God that he'll trust us with all of them if we'll be faithful with the ones that he's given us to start with. And I, I, again, I, I point out that there's a difference between be, having a gift and being gifted having a long suit do you see you see what i'm saying there's there's a difference between uh, an elder where it says he must be apt to teach versus a five-fold teacher who has a long suit in that area there's a difference and so same with these gifts so word of mouth word, so we have these nine word of wisdom word of wisdom is basically Wisdom and understanding that comes supernaturally that you cannot know through the natural realm. A good example is where Solomon, who is supposedly the wisest man on earth. Well, why was he wise? Not because of natural wisdom, but because of supernatural wisdom. When the, when the two women came with the one baby and he said, okay, divide the baby in two, 
that would be a bad thing to say if both mother was to say, yeah, okay, good. But supernaturally, the Holy Spirit knew that the true mother was not going to accept that. That was a word of wisdom. A word of knowledge is where you receive some knowledge or information that's come supernaturally that, that is uh, not necessarily what to do. For instance, when, when the word of wisdom was what to do, take the baby, cut the baby in half. Now, he didn't actually carry that out, but by speaking that, it revealed the hidden truth. So that therefore, <clears throat> so that therefore, uh, the situation, the, ju the true judgment could be delivered. So word of wisdom is where you get something from heaven that's like, um, uh, you know, for instance, when uh, Asa the prophet who was blind and Jeroboam came to him and was all, he, even though Asa the prophet was blind, Asa put on a disguise to come to him. And Asa says, you know, your disguise doesn't fool me. And so, you know, because you tried to trick me, you know, here's your judgment. That was a word of knowledge that came from heaven. And then the word of wisdom was what to do with that. Um, then uh, faith but by the same spirit. Now, faith, what kind of faith are we talking about here? We're talking about a gift of faith. Now, there's different kinds of faith, right? There's at least three. As I mentioned, we're spirit, soul, and body. Abraham was the father of all those that believe. The first kind of faith is, is in the natural. It's believing. It's getting from here to there. In other words, it was attributed to Abraham for righteousness that he left Ur of the Chaldees and came to where God sent him. In other words, he got from here to there. If you get yourself up in the morning and go to church, that's called faithfulness. That's the first kind of faith. That's the kind that gets you, you know, gets you up to go from one place to another. A natural person can have that kind of faith. In other words, in, uh, in Romans chapter 10, where it says, you know, uh, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. For with the, with the, uh, the mouth you confess and with the heart you believe, right? And so you're saved by faith through, uh, faith, saved by grace through faith. Okay, so therefore, if you didn't have some faith before you were saved, you could never get saved. You have to have natural faith in order to confess. Then you get saved. Now you have an opportunity for supernatural faith, which is a different kind of faith. So when Jesus said, if you had faith like the grain of a mustard seed, that's a different kind of faith than Abraham's faith, where that got him from Ur over to Israel by faithfulness. He got here, he went there, and then he hung out there, you know, and, and waited for the promise. Supernatural faith is where you have a tiny little bit, but it's enough to do something that can't be done in the natural. You're moving a mountain, you're raising the dead, you're casting out demons. If I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. If I, by the finger of God, it only takes God's finger, just a little bit of faith, like a grain of a mustard seed. That's a different kind. But then there's also there's there's also the the, the soul faith that's in that in the natural area. Also, where we, uh, where we have a, a natural faith that we can bring under the spirit, under the, the um, umbrella of blessing and sort of uh, have it washed, so to speak, and have it. So anyway, we've got those different kinds of faith. So this right here, when it talks about faith, it's talking about supernatural faith. That's why it's in the category of gifts. This is like the, this is like the faith. That's like the grain of the mustard seed. That's the kind of faith this is talking about, not just faithfulness. Now, sometimes faithfulness will get us into a place to receive supernatural faith. But the supernatural faith is its own gift. Does this make sense? Uh, so anyway, that's, a, that's the type of faith we're talking about here. Then gifts of healings by the same spirit, gifts of healings. And that's plural. It's kind of like... Um, the fruit of the spirit and there's nine of them again you see the number nine for spirit and so there's nine of them in a the cluster it's it's one gift of holy spirit and it produces fruit in a cluster that, and there's nine of them <clears throat> so workings 
of miracles and gifts of healing are also in plural in that sense. So you see, you're going to see them not just one. It's like you don't just get one gift of healing and then that's it for your life. You know, you if you're going to walk in this gift, there you can walk in the gift. The gift is going to be there for you to use to bless others. For back to verse seven, for the profit of all in the church, for those that come into the church to be blessed by this gift. These gifts are not for you, but for you to give, to use, to bless the church. Give it away. Now, there certainly are benefits to it, but, you know, working of healing, uh, working of miracles and healing. I like to point out uh, an example, like, for instance, John G. Lake. You know, John G. Lake, you know, he had his ministry up here west of us in Spokane, and, you know, he did a lot of work down in South Africa, and a lot of people got healed, but, you know, People don't realize how many of his team died. His wife died in, in uh, South Africa, and many of his team died. And so, but yet they would pray for people, and they were getting healed. And I don't know if, if I know the answer to that, but what I feel like, uh, what I share anyway, that I believe is from the Lord, is that he walked in gifts of healing, but for instance, the gift that he had was for the church. And the church sometimes fails the people who have the gift when they need help. In other words, when John G. Lake got sick, somebody needed to pray for him. His gift wasn't for himself. Somebody needed to come back and pray for him. I'll give you a perfect example with me one time. I, my knees were really, really bad for years. They were really bad. I was getting, I, was, I wasn't that old, but uh, and I wanted to be able to climb the mountains, you know, until I'm quite old. But uh, I was down in Colorado, uh, and I was ministering at a church, and I was teaching on um, healing and different things about how to pray for the sick and see uh, a greater percentage of them healed and so on, T things that I've learned and, and imparting things. And, and one of the things I taught them was that when you get a revelation, word of knowledge, for instance, then take action on that word of knowledge. Don't just say, oh, I've got a word. a word of knowledge by itself is an open door, but it's an open door to take action. So I said, if you get a word of knowledge, take action on that. So I would pray for people and the Lord would show me something about like say, wow, you know, I'm really feeling something in my left shoulder. You know, you got something going on in your shoulder. Oh, yeah, I had an accident. I'll give you an example. One time I was praying for a lady. And she said, would you pray for my husband? He wasn't there. And I prayed for her husband. And, and, and then she said, would you pray for my son? He's going in for an operation. Uh, he's got some intestinal problems that have really been bothering him. He's going in for an operation on Tuesday. I said, sure, let me pray for him. So, you know, I prayed for him in proxy. I laid hands on her. <clears throat> and uh, when I laid hands on her, my lower back just got really a lot of pain. And I said, well, let me pray for his back. And she got kind of mad at me, which was kind of odd. But she said, no, no, it's his, it's his intestines. And I said, well, I'll pray for his intestines. But I want to pray in the order that God shows me. So I'm going to pray for his back, his lower back. So I prayed for his lower back and for his spine, for his hips and some you know, things like that. Then I prayed for his his intestines, but that was more in the natural. In the spirit, I prayed what I felt in my body. Well, I didn't find this out till the next time I was back at that church, maybe uh, a number of months later, but she came up to me and she, she apologized. She says, you know, I got really upset when you, when you prayed for my son, when I asked you to pray for my son, because you prayed for his back and his hips. And um, I wanted you to pray for his intestine because that's what he was going to be operated on for. He'd been to the doctor numerous times. They couldn't solve the pain, so he was going in. They were going to open him up and whatever they do. But when I got home, I was telling my, you know, he's an adult, uh, an adult son, and, and she says, I was telling him, you know, about you and that you prayed for his back, and I was kind of upset. And um, he goes, wait a minute. He prayed for my back? And he goes, she goes, yeah. Wow, I never thought of this, but he said, in other words, he hadn't thought of this, but this intestinal problem started right after he had gotten thrown from a horse. He got thrown from the horse, and then they had an intestinal problem. So he went in for his stomach problem, but he never connected it with the getting thrown from the horse and landing, you know, hard. And so he went, I'm not, I'm going to go see the chiropractor tomorrow. He's supposed to go into the doctor for the operation on Tuesday. So he went to the chiropractor on Monday. When he walked in the door, the chiropractor looked at him across the room and said, what happened to you? Your hips are way out of line. And, and he, he, you know, he took him in the room and fixed it uh, without going. To the, so he canceled his appointment to the, for the operation.
So that was a word of knowledge. See, it wasn't healing because I didn't, he didn't get healed by my prayer, but he got healed because of the word of knowledge by taking action on it. So, um, so in this one situation in Colorado where I was teaching them, uh, and like I said, I was having a lot of pain in my knees. Well, I was going around praying for people, and I had released them to go pray for each other. And this, this couple of women came over to me, and um, uh, one of them says to me, are you having pain in your legs? Or maybe she said leg. I can't remember. But she said, are you having pain in your legs? And I said, well, yeah, I am. I didn't tell it was my knees, but I said, yeah. She was, oh, I thought so. I thought she got so excited. And her friend that she told to, they got excited. And they started to walk away. I said, wait a minute. Come back here. <laughs> I said, remember what I taught you? That when you get a word of knowledge, take action on it. I said, this is my turn to get healed. My turn to get prayed for. So I sat down in the chair. And I said, now you pray for me. Now, again, I didn't tell them it was my knees. Well, they sat down on the floor at my feet. And they just naturally laid their hands on my knees. Without knowing it, again, it was the word, the word, the spirit of God working in them. Well, they laid hands on my knees, and the one lady who got the word of knowledge about the pain in my legs, she prayed for the pain in my legs. When she got done, her friend prayed specifically for my knees. When she prayed for my knees, um, both of my kneecaps came, became like jello. They just went boom. They both went ah. And I went, oh, that's cool. And the pastor was standing next to me right over my shoulder with a, with a recorder going, I said, Steve, put your hand on here. Feel that. And you could feel, and I said it was an angel. I didn't see the angel, but I felt like it was the physician angel changing kneecaps, I guess. You know, Because it was like my knees became, you know, a kneecap is hard. You know, and it became my jello. And, they, re, you know, my knees got replaced. And they've been fine ever since. And I've been climbing the mountains. You know, I was down in New Mexico here. Uh, earlier this month and I was climbing up these cliffs that you can't believe with these young guys and they were like man how old are you when I'm your age I want to be able to keep up with you and I'm like well yeah, good that's an answer that shows that my prayer has been answered but anyway so that's an example of where, see where I feel like I needed to not only teach them but I had to coach them come back and pray for me the person who's re when you have a gift in this category it's for the church. It's not necessarily for you. But the church should give back. Someone like John G. Lake that has a supernatural gift of healing. In other words, he, he has a long suit in this area. It's for the church, but the church should give back. And John G. Lake needs to be prayed for or someone like him. You see what I'm saying? The prophets need prophecy too. The, the healers need healing too. You see? And so the church should give back. And so that's my example. Actually, that was... That was uh, that, they had me write that up in a chapter in a book called, I think it was Miracles Still Happen, and I was on Sid Roth's show once years ago telling that story. Um, so uh, there's another book coming out. They just put another chapter. I forget what, what I wrote. But anyway, so that story got published. So, um, But it's a good example. Now, where did I leave off? Now, to another prophecy. So again, to another what? A lot of people translate this because they believe each one gets a gift. Each one gets one gift. So they say to another person is getting prophecy. But no, it says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the prophet. The subject is prophet. So it's to another prophet, meaning benefit. It's the word benefit. For another benefit, we have gifts of healing. For another benefit, we have work, workings of miracles. For another benefit to the church, we have prophecy. For another benefit to the church, we have discerning of spirits. For another benefit to the church, we have different kinds of tongues. And to another benefit to the church. So the subject is profit or benefit up in verse 7. So you have to understand that each one of these is a benefit, not a gift only one person gets. You see the difference? And so, again, to, to uh, explain this prophecy, this is the gift of prophecy. This is what the Bible calls edification, exhortation, or comfort. But it's a message from God or for God to the person or to the church. And it's a gift of prophecy. It's not the gift of prophet, but it's a gift of prophecy. 
and we all may prophesy. When, when uh, Moses laid hands on the uh, elders in the wilderness, um, there were two in the camp, remember, that got the spirit. And they said, hey, there's two in the camp, and they didn't go to prophet school. We better tell them to shut up, you know. And Moses said, look, don't envy for my sake. I would to God that all God's people prophesied or, or were prophets. That's the word nabi. There's three different words in the Old Testament for prophet. There's nabi, roa, and chosen. Nabi means to speak by inspiration. Uh, for instance, Nathan was a nabi prophet. He never uh, had a vision. There's no vision listed that, that Nathan had. There's no foretelling that Nathan had, but he spoke by inspiration. And when Moses said, I would to God, all God's people were prophets, it was those that speak by inspiration. On the day of Pentecost, when Joel's prophecy that the sons and daughters would prophesy, that came to pass. We all are Nabi prophets on the level of what Moses spoke. That doesn't mean we're all fivefold level of what we're going to get to in Ephesians 4. But if any one of us were translated back to the Old Testament with the gift of prophecy, people would line up at your door every morning to hear from God. And yet we sometimes forget to prophesy every day because we, we take it for granted. We, it becomes, uh, it becomes uh, more comely or, you know, um, we profane it. It becomes more common. But the Old Testament, boy, they didn't have that many people who could speak by inspiration. But that came to pass on Pentecost, that we got that wish or, or proclamation of, of Moses. To another benefit, we have the gift of prophecy, discerning of spirits. That's the ability to supernaturally tell the spirit that may be present or absent and what spirit it is. In other words, you can tell with discerning of spirits if a person is not born again, if there's an absence of Holy Spirit. You know that person needs to be led to the Lord. Now, you're not going to know that necessarily by listening to them. You might hear somebody preach the Bible. Well, I was in Argentina here years ago with um, a number of people, including Ed Sabozo. We had priests coming to the meetings, Catholic priests, and they would get saved. They hadn't been saved. They had never been taught uh, you know, salvation, the message of salvation, but yet they'd been speaking the Bible and teaching Bible stories. I knew a gentleman one time that years ago was a Bible salesman back when he used to have fuller brush, brush salesman and, and you know door-to-door -door salesman. He would go door-to-door -door and sell Bibles in the Bible Belt. He wasn't saved. He went to prison or went to jail, I mean, for, I forget, for something like drinking a driver or something. While he was in jail, he read the Bible for the first time and he got born again. But see, he didn't have the spirits. But yet, you might have thought he did because he was selling Bibles. But by the spirit, discerning of spirits we can discern the presence or absence of the spirit when i was in new mexico here recently things were disappearing they were getting lost and at, things just were getting lost and i took a it took a few times before i realized wait a minute this is not normal this is spiritual this is a spirit the devil comes to steal kill and destroy i am come and i recognize it was a it was a spirit of I called it a spirit of petty theft. There wasn't a person involved. You know, a lot of, the, a lot of that was happening when we were away from people. But once I discerned that it was a spirit that was delivered authority in that area, you know, many times you're in a border town. Border towns tend to have petty theft. Sometimes they have murder because people can do those things and then cross the border. Well, that's a border state. And I was dealing with the spirit. Once I realized it was a spirit, I took dominion over that spirit. Not only did things not get disappear, but everything that had disappeared came back because it was spiritual. And once I discerned it as a spirit, I took dominion over spirit. Now, if there was another name, you know, the Lord could have given me the name. That's just the name I gave it, a spirit of petty theft, you know. And so I took dominion over because it's the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So I realized that if the devil can't steal your joy, he can't steal your goods. So I made sure I wasn't going to get lose my joy because my stuff was disappearing and I ended up getting it all back uh, by discerning that spirit. And then not just discerning it, though, I had to take dominion over it. You see, I'd take action. 
Uh, then different kinds of tongues. That's not just speaking in tongues, but that's, you know, it's, it's tongues of man and of angels. And in 1 Corinthians 14, it even talks about uh, a ministry of tongues where you have uh, certain people have a long suit in that area. I remember one time I was praying for people in a line at a church. They were coming up and I was praying over people and prophesying. And, and a lot of times I'll speak in tongues uh, uh, as I lay hands on somebody and then let the spirit bring out whatever he wants. And this one time I laid hands on a, a woman and the spirit, uh, the, 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 uh, the tongue changed. And it was like, it was like, whoa, this, it was a, it was a war, warfare spirit. And what it did was this woman had demons and the, the tongue that I was speaking was some sort of warfare tongue that whatever it did, it told those demons to do something. I think it told them to put on the handcuffs. And then I cast the demons out. And I didn't have to even deal with the demons that much uh, in English except to say, you know, cast them out. Because they, the tongues itself discerned the demons and what to do about it. It's the tongues of men and of angels. So therefore, you know, when I, I didn't discern it. The spirit already discerned it. Then I figured out what was going on. I cast the spirit out, um, the demon out. But again, that's, that's a, a gift of tongues. Huh? Sorry, can you explain long suit? You talked about long suit. Yeah, long suit is a specialty in the area. For instance, we all can, let's say, speak in tongues. Now, not everybody does, but we all may. We all may prophesy. Paul said that, but we all don't. But there are some that have a long suit in prophecy. There is someone that comes up and lays hands. I'm not saying they're a prophet, but they lay hands on you. And when they get done, it's like, oh, my goodness, man, you hit it right on the head. You know, you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, th there's, there's people who have a long suit in word of knowledge. You're seeing Sean Boltz walking that right now. We all can walk in word of knowledge. But there's some that have a long suit, a specialty in that area, uh, a, a special, you know, they're gifted in that gift is another way to say it. Does that make sense? So a long suit, uh, you, you know, is someone, I believe we all have all, we have the ability to walk in all nine of these because we all have the gift of the Holy Spirit. But I don't necessarily believe we're all going to be gifted in all the gifts. There's going to be some that you're going to walk in very strongly and others you're going to walk in from time to time. Maybe if we lived long enough, we could have a long suit in all nine. But, you know, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's, we're not going to live that long. I don't know. But we, what I want to try to get them across to people if you'll study the scriptures maybe you'll come to the same conclusion that your faith can open the door for you to walk in all nine and there's certain ones you're going to be gifted in or have a long suit in and if you concentrate on those and be happy with you know working there god will open the doors or, or allow you to to step through in into the others too so then another interpretation of tongues i used to think interpretation of tongues was not in the old testament but then I remembered many, many tinkles, you far sin on the wall, and, and uh, Daniel was able to interpret that tongue. So we ha even have tongues of interpretation in the Old Testament, but it wasn't, it wasn't widely distributed. It was, uh, you know, when Daniel did that, that was really something. You see what I'm saying? When he interpreted that tongue. But that was the tongue of men or, or of angels that was written out there, uh, and it was interpreted by him. Uh, so anyway... Uh, interpreting of dreams can be in that similar category uh, that you're interpreting those those words that are in pictures like hieroglyphics you know are, are words if you would interpret hieroglyphics that's a tongue so same thing when you're interpreting visions and dreams you know it's in that same strain or, or category but some people are gifted in those areas does that make sense Again, then I'll just read, again, I'll read verse 11. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one, dividing to each one severally as he intends, okay? All right, let's uh, move on to the next one, which is Ephesians chapter four. I'm not going too slow, am I? All right. Well, I'm having fun, I hope you are. <laughs> The motivational ministries of the Lord. Okay, back in First Corinthians 12, there we saw that there's the there's uh, different ministries, but the same Lord. 
I call these the motivational ministries. These, these help to equip us and motivate us into different functions. There's five of them. This is the number for grace. These are called, can effectively be called grace gifts. Now, of course, all gifts are given by grace. But specifically, you can call these grace gifts because they are five of them. Um, these are not given according to ability. Remember, Moses was a prophet, but he couldn't speak. Ahijah was a seer, but he couldn't see in the natural. So let's look at these different ministries, but the same Lord in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Therefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. Now this, this is a parenthesis. Now this, he ascended. What is it? Uh, New King James says, now this. King James says, what is it? I like King James because what is it? That's manna. Old Testament, that's manna. What is it? Remember, they had manna, bread that came down from heaven. Here we have him ascending and it says, what is it? In the King James. He ascended. What does it mean that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended also is the one who ascended far above all the heavens. And he might fill all things. And he himself gave some. So, so it says, what is it? Which is manna. And then it says he goes up to heaven and he hands down these things from heaven. Well, manna came down from heaven. So in, kind of, in a sense, these five ministries are like bread from heaven. To help feed us. Well, verse 11, he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some shepherds and teachers. I say shepherds because we, uh, I, want, I want to emphasize the gift, not a position in a pulpit, okay? I know all the translations translate that, Pastor, but uh, it's the same word that's translated shepherds and other, mostly throughout the New Testament. For the purpose of... For equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So what category is this? Is this for the world? Is this for the non-believer? Well, it can affect the non-believer. It can bless the non-believer. It can influence the non-believer. But its main purpose is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So the main purpose that we should be seeing with these five gifts, these are grace gifts that are given to the church, to the saints. So their primary function is to the church. Their primary field of action is the church to help the saints do the works of service, the works of ministry. We use the word ministry to often mean something that we see within the church, within a pulpit or whatever. It just means service. To help the saints get equipped to do service wherever they are. For the edifying of the body of Christ. See, again, we see the body of Christ. The first primary calling of these five ministries is not necessarily the world, but the body. The body of Christ is called to, the, to minister to the world. The five ministries are called to bring grace and to be grace to the body. All right, until we have them, until... We all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And I always, some, I often will ask in a church, you know, and I'm sharing this verse, I'll say, now, anybody in here perfect? You'd be surprised, occasionally, occasionally hands go up. And I have to say, now lying is a sin, so you're not perfect. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, in Christ, yeah, in your spirit. But, uh, and we have have these until we're a perfect man. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Two questions, and that was um, David Joy wants to know who is the seer who cannot see in the natural. He missed that. That was Ahijah, A H I J A H. And then um, Deidre is asking, were weren't the nine gifts also for the body too? Where's the nine gifts? What? Weren't the nine gifts also for the body as well? Yeah, it's uh, yeah. They're for the church. That's what we saw there. Uh, it says, for the prophet of all, and it's, that word all is to the church. In other words, the, co the context of it is the church. That doesn't mean word of knowledge isn't going to bless people outside the church. Or remember when the church, when somebody comes into the church and you prophesy according to the, 
the, uh, the, the secrets of their heart and they fall down. But it's primarily to edify, exhort, and comfort the church. That's, that's the gifts are given in order to bless all and the category he was writing to the church in Corinth. So by understanding the context, you know what I'm saying? Now, again, back to when, when the Syrophoenician woman came to Jesus and she wanted her daughter healed. And Jesus said, no, it's not for you. It's, if, you if you brought it up into the book of Acts, it'd be, it's for the body of Christ. He said it's for the, the, the house of Israel. So it's like it's for the church. And she says, yeah, but even the dogs get the, you know, get the crumbs. He said, wow, you got great faith. So in other words, we don't have to be stingy with them, but the focus of them is the church. And then it will spill out as the church gets filled. Does that make sense? Um, so. so Lloyd, I was just asking, um, how, how do you perceive these two passages to be different the ephesians 4 to um first corinthians 12 well that's what i'm going to cover here right now and then i'm okay. going to, <laughs> to, to show you the differences in in romans chapter 12 so we're just about there you're just prophetic and you're one step ahead of me <laughs> all right these gifts, it says, he himself gave some to be, not to have. To be prophets, apostles, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Back, <clears throat> excuse me, back in 1 Corinthians 12, we have the gift of prophecy. Here in Ephesians 4, we are the gift of prophet. Back in Ephesians, uh, and back in 1 Corinthians 12, we have the gift of working of miracles. Here we have someone who is the gift of, let's say, uh, an evangelist. He doesn't have a gift of evangelism. He is the gift. You see the difference? When we have a gift of faith, it's different than being a gift of faith. So we have a gift of, let's say we have a gift of teaching. We're going to talk about that in, in Romans 12. You can have a gift to teach, but not be a gifted teacher. You can have a gift to teach, but not have your life given to the church as a teacher. Does that make sense? Here in Ephesians chapter 4, we have a gift of teacher. The person who is a teacher is a person who Jesus has given their life to the church as a teacher, as a gift of teacher. And Jesus continues his ministry of a teacher to the church through that individual. Jesus is the apostle of the church, and he gives certain people to the church as apostles, and he continues his ministry of apostle to the church through those individuals. Jesus is our prophet. He gives certain people at their lives as gifts to the church as prophets, and then he continues his ministry of a prophet to the church through those individuals. And that's the same for evangelists and teachers and, and pastors and shepherds. Does that make sense? So you can have a person who might shepherd but not be a shepherd. In other words, we should have leaders in the church that have a heart towards the sheep, but then there are people who are gifted shepherds and they may never step in a pulpit. A shepherd is someone who gathers the sheep and the sheep know his voice or her voice and they follow him. So someone who is a shepherd has the gift of gathering and, and guiding the sheep. And where is he going to gather them and guide them to? Now, if, I, if we spent the whole night on just shepherds, we could spend a lot of time on just what a biblical shepherd is. But, but briefly, a shepherd is someone who the sheep hear his voice and they follow. And there's women shepherds. Look at Zipporah. When, when um, uh, Eliezer found Zipporah, 
No, no, no. Moses found support. Eliezer found uh, Rachel, didn't he? Anyway. Well, anyway, both both Rachel and, um, no, Rahab. No. All right, let me get it back. Let me back up. Rebecca. Sorry. It was Rebecca that was a shepherd that um, Eliezer found, remember? And then when Moses found Zipporah, she was fighting off the other shepherds, and he jumped in and defended her. And so, in other words, you had Zipporah was a shepherd, shepherdess, uh, Rebecca was a shepherdess, Moses was a shepherd, uh, Jacob was a shepherd, Josh, uh, let's see, uh, Joseph was a shepherd. But what's interesting you see about all those shepherds and shepherdesses, they didn't own the sheep. David didn't own the sheep. All of them watched the sheep for their fathers or their father-in-laws. And that's a principle for shepherds in the New Testament. When we have shepherds that act like they own the sheep, they're not functioning biblically. They should recognize they don't own the sheep. They're watching the sheep for their father. And that's a principle that we have true shepherds when they understand that, that and then they don't abuse the flock. You know, of course, Ezekiel talks about shepherds that abuse the flock. So when we have a true shepherd, as a pastor, okay, as a pastor, using the term like we use it to mean the chief elder in a church, okay, the lead elder, uh, the set man of our church. As a pastor, I always would love to have shepherds in my congregation. Why? Because number one, they're going to help take care of the people. And number two, they're going to draw more people because they have a natural ability to gather the flock. And so I just, we concentrate on shepherding the shepherds. <laughs> Now let the shepherd shepherd the sheep. You see what I'm saying? But that person's life is given to the church as a shepherd. Now let me ask you a question. How many times is the word shepherd or pastor in the New Testament? George is smart. How many times? Yes. Ephesians 4, 11, 12, 13. That's right, right here in Ephesians 4. Uh, no, actually, I take that back. The only time we're talking about the shepherd, the uh, only time we're talking about the shepherd in the singular is when it talks about Jesus, the good shepherd. Every other time it's plural, including here in Ephesians, where it says shepherds or pastors. So in other words, unless we're talking about Jesus, the shepherds need to be working together. Jesus is the only shepherd, singular. Every other shepherd needs to be working with other shepherds over the flock. That makes sense? <laughs> so Jesus is the only one that has the right to be a shepherd. The rest of us need to be uh, one of the shepherds. Does that make sense? Well, anyway, the reason I like to use the word shepherd is because we confuse it with the word pastor which biblically is the same word in the Greek, but we don't use it that way. I won't go into that tonight, but when we use the word pastor, we're talking about an eldership position, which is not a gift. It is a position, and Paul told Timothy, you know, if you, anyone who desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work, and there's the difference between a good work and a gift that Jesus gave. So here we're not talking about good works. We're talking about gifts. He ascended up on high, and he gave gifts. And the gifts are apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. They don't have the gift of apostle. They are the gift of apostle. Does that make sense? So briefly, apostles govern, excuse me, prophets guide, evangelists gather, shepherds guard, and teachers ground. Just to give one word direction. Of course, we know that, we know that, uh, you know, Teachers teach, shepherds shepherd, evangelists evangelize, and prophets prophesy, and apostles apostle. But what does that mean? <laughs> um, what is the difference between a prophet and a seer? Well, in the Old Testament it says they were called seers at first, but then they started calling them prophets. Uh, the difference is not all prophets see visions and dreams. Uh, and a lot of people who see dreams and vision, because the Bible says that 
your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old man will dream dreams, your young man will see visions. And of course, I always jokingly say the reason the old men see the dreams is because they take naps. <laughs> I'm joking when I say that. But anyway, but you see, there's also a spiritual side of that, that the spirit will come in and help old people rekindle their dreams. But, uh, but nevertheless, the difference is a seer is someone that sees visions and dreams. Now, there are prophets that have a specialty in that area of seeing dreams and visions. But then there are also people who are in the sons and daughters category that have the Holy Spirit that are not necessarily fivefold gifts, but you might call them a seer in the sense of uh, that they see dreams and visions. In our group, we have a lot of folks, and you see that at Morningstar too, you get around people and it rubs off on you. And you have a lot of people seeing dreams and visions because they're, it just rubs off on them. It used to be I would see dreams and visions, uh, but then I'd get around Rick Joyner and I'd start having them all the time. You know, and now I have them all the time. And I, I attribute some of that to just being around Rick and rubbing shoulders with him, that there's an anointing that got transferred that was added to what was already, it, it kind of like um, jump-started what was already there. So again, a seer is someone that sees dreams or visions, and you can have a prophet in the in the sense of a fivefold ministry prophet that sees dreams or visions, but you can also have one that brings prophecy that doesn't necessarily uh, have a long suit in dreams, visions, uh, and, and and may not be a seer in that sense. Does that make sense? Thank you. So back, back to the five then, you know, where the teachers teach and the prophets prophesy, but the apostles, apostle, what does that mean? For me to say an apostle, apostles, that doesn't mean anything, does it? Apostle just means sent one. When Jesus, sent, Jesus said, I will send you apostles and prophets. So they're actually both sent ones, but apostles come to complete a task. Prophets come to bring a message. So apostles must have at least one other gift. There is, I met a guy in Africa one time. He said he was an apostle. I said, well, what kind of an apostle? He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, nobody can be just an apostle. What kind of an apostle are you? And, uh, but he was stumped by that. I said, well, I'll tell you what kind of an apostle you are. He goes, what kind? I said, a hippie apostle. You're just somebody who likes to wander around and mooch off people. You know, you're not really, you're not really apostle at all. You're just, and what was funny was a friend of mine was, had been sitting next to him in the Jeep and he told me, <laughs> he said, you know, when you said he was a hippie apostle, you know what he was listening to on his little Walkman? I said, what? He goes, the Beatles. <laughs> well, anyway, the point was, is, is that nobody can just be an apostle. Every apostle must walk in at least one of the others. In other words, You'll have a teaching apostle. You'll have a prophet apostle. You'll have a, 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 a shepherding apostle. You'll have, in other words, now, now some people teach that apostles have to have all five. I never have taught that. But I do believe that apostles at times will walk in any of the five, depending on the need. I'm not an evangelist, but there's many people around the world who think I am because I evangelize them. There's whole villages in certain third world countries where the whole village came to the Lord. So to them, I'm their evangelist, even though I'm not given, my, my life is not given to the body of Christ as an evangelist. I met uh, Bob Weiner once in Texas in a restaurant. He was kind of talking to these guys at, at a table, and I was sitting there. And then, you know, being an being a evangelist, you know, he, he, was, he saw me listening, so he drew me and, and the guys at my table in, and we introduced ourselves. And so he went on and on, as he does, because he's an evangelist. He's an apostolic evangelist, but... So he gets all done with his whole thing and he hands out his little bookmarks with 17 steps to evangelism. He says, so now, Lord, you're going to go back to Missoula and you're going to evangelize everybody? I said, no. And it kind of shocked him. I said, no, that's your job. You're the evangelist. I said, you're supposed to equip the saints to do the evangelism. So in time, we brought Bob Weiner here and he equipped the saints to do the evangelism. He said, if I tried to do it, you know, it, it may or may not work, you know, because I'm not gifted in that area. Now, there's times when the Lord has sent me to accomplish that. And at those times, he's gifted me to do it. But that doesn't mean my life has been given to the church as an evangelist. I have evangelized. I've done the work of an evangelist. 
like Paul told Timothy. So uh, back to the apostle, if somebody says they're an apostle, we have a right to know what kind of an apostle. And the other thing is, even Paul said, even if I'm a, not an apostle to others, I am to you. Nobody's an apostle to everybody except for Jesus. We all have spheres that we, that we walk in. And so in those spheres, we may have apostleship. Now, we may have a, a teaching ministry that's broader than apostleship, if we're, you know, I'm assuming we're talking about apostles. Same thing, we, might have, we may have a, a prophet apostle that the Lord sends him at times, and he's a prophet, and he accomplishes a task as the, prop, the apostle, but he may have a broader ministry of prophet to nations or to governments or so on that's beyond his apostleship. There's nothing wrong with that as long as we understand those spheres. But the main thing for you to understand, and as, long as, as far as these gifts, the gifts of the same Lord are ministries. The gifts are the person. The person is the apostle. He doesn't carry the gift of apostle. He is the gift of apostle. The person has, uh, the person is the gift of prophet. Whereas in 1 Corinthians 12, the person has the gift of prophecy, and that's a different level. The gift of prophecy in the New Testament is to bring edification, exhortation, and comfort. Whereas the gift of prophet may bring spanking to the body of Christ. Does that make sense? The prophet is in a different category, in a different level, and he may need to bring some spanking. Does that make sense? We need prophets, but we also need prophecy that edifies us. And a true shepherd will bring mercy. You know, a, a shepherd, you know, is binding up the wounds and caring for the sheep. Have the prophet to come in, we, we, we'd be out of balance. We need both those things. We need the teacher to come in and ground the body of Christ in the word of God to strengthen us, right? So anyway, um, any questions, any more questions on that category before we move on to the, the third category. Um, I, I have one. Does does the um, prophetic gift change as you grow? So, like, I seem to, when I was younger, I seemed to have more words. And then as I got older, I had more visions. And I didn't, under, I don't understand the change, except there was a gap in my life where I didn't where it was kind of the church I was in suppressed, that kind of thing. So I had a lot and then nothing, and then I had a lot again. Yeah. But I wondered why um, now as, as an older person, I'm 63 now, and um, why would my gifting be different to when I was younger? Well, the old man see visions. I mean, see dreams, I mean. <laughs> just, just kidding. Um, I think we go through seasons. You can't say there's going to be a same, the same steps for everybody or same stages for everybody. But we all go through stages. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in because he is a personal guide. Uh, Jesus said, I'm going to go away and I'm going to send you the comforter who's going to be your counselor and your guide. So we each have a personal um, discipler the Holy Spirit disciples us each individually and he'll have us on our own course. That's best for us and also best for the body, the body that we're ministering to. So in other words, we go through those stages. Now he, the gifts and calling of God are, are without repentance. So we never lose anything. In other words, you may, you may go from one category where you give words and you go into another time period when you're seeing more dreams or visions. Those may be open doors that you've gone through, but you still have the ability to give words, even though you might not be moving it as often. You haven't lost that ability. It's still there, and you can retrieve it if, as necessary. Um, but, but the Lord himself is the one that takes us through our stages of training to take us into new areas. And then sometimes we can get too comfortable. You know, I remember when I uh, was first called out to begin to travel and preach, and man, people wanted to have words of knowledge. They wanted to be prayed over. And I love doing it. And I love seeing the miracles that come when you bring words of knowledge and so on. Then there were times when I'd show up and Lord would say, okay, I want you to teach tonight, but I want you to pray over anybody. And I'm like, what? But I want to pray over them. And they're expecting it, you know. Well, I had to obey him because what he was doing was testing me to see if my identity was in the gift 
or if my identity was in him and obviously my obedience to him. And so what I learned was people will adjust. You just tell them, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lay hands on anybody tonight, but I'm still gonna minister to you. So pay attention to what I have to say because the Lord's gonna bring the things that you need through the words that are released. You know, and so that was a test for me and I had to learn that. Uh, if I hadn't learned that, I think, you know, he'll, he'll bring it up another time. You know what he'll do if we're really disobedient in those areas of gifts? He'll turn off the anointing. And so you'll still be praying for people, but there won't be an anointing. And now the test is you can get it anointed by another source. There are people walking in true gifts that are having their gift anointed by a wrong spirit. Now that might stretch your mind, but that is true because the gift is from heaven, but it's like a, it's like a hose with a sprinkler on. You know, if you have a sprinkler in your front yard, if you know what I'm talking about, the sprinkler is the gift, but the hose is the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit says to you, okay, tonight I don't want you to use that gift, you need to turn off that water, so to speak. Now, if your identity is in your gift, you're going to be tempted to turn it on to a different hose. And a different spirit can function through that. You can still prophesy, but with a different spirit. You see what I'm saying? That's a whole other subject, but we have to learn to trust God and not have our identity in our gift, even though we want to press in and even though we want to covet the best gifts, but our identity has to be in Christ. Otherwise, we end up prophesying to people's, the idols of their hearts and things like that, and we need to pay attention. To I gave a woman a, a word one time at a church, and I remember she came up for prophecy, and I, and I gave her a word, and it basically was something along the lines of, you don't need a word. You have had enough words. You need to live the words I've already given you. Something like that. And I was like, geez, that was harsh. <laughs> I thought. And afterwards, I went to the pastor. He didn't hear that word. But I went to him and I asked him, uh, you know, I, I, have to, I have to have this prophecy judged. He goes, well, what was it? And I told him, he goes, well, who was that? And I described the woman. He goes, oh, man, that was perfect. He says, that woman, he says, she has been in the prophetic movement before there was a prophetic movement. And she travels the country and she gets prophecies and she writes them up and she types them up and she has them in three ring binders. And she has a whole shelf of three ring binders. And all she does is take those down and read them over and over and then laments why none of them have come to pass. But she doesn't do anything with them. She just reads them over and over, but she doesn't obey them. So your word was perfect. You didn't prophesied to the idols of her heart what she wanted to hear you prophesied what she needed to do i was like oh good <laughs> you see what i'm saying that was good that was good so anyway so so um anyway i got uh, we go through stages and we go through through things and, you know and i uh we also can pick things up i already mentioned now i was taught that god gives the gifts and there's nothing you can do about it da, 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 da. Then I realized where, where Paul said to Timothy, don't neglect the gift that is in you by the laying on of my hands. Well, then I had to deal with that because that contradicted my doctrine that I had been taught. I think there can be impartation. Now, what, what was that gift? We don't know what, if that was a gift in the category of 1 Corinthians 12 or was that a gift in the category of uh, Ephesians chapter 4. I believe that God, it says here that the, the Lord Jesus gives these five gifts. But I believe we can stir them up, and I believe we can commission them. I believe we can ordain them in accordance with the Lord, uh, his directions. And so I believe that we can influence people. So if you're, Jesus said, if you're faithful in that which is least, he'll give you more. And that's in the category of ministry. And, and he also said in that same verse, he said, if you're faithful with what is another man's, then I'll give you your own. He also said, if you're not faithful in what is another man's, who will give you your own? In other words, we have, if we're faithful like a disciple or like a student, then what happens many times is we get a revelation and we think automatically we have authority. We don't. In my book, I talk about the rah-rah principle that I came up with. Rah-rah. Let me see if I can remember what it is. Revelation, accountability, responsibility, and then authority. So rah, rah. We want to jump right from the revelation to the authority, but the biblical principle or stage is 
you get the revelation, but you make yourself accountable. In time, you get responsibility. When you're faithful with the responsibility, then you're given authority. So that's the rah-rah principle about our walking in our gifts. Okay? All right. So now we move to the, the different... Can we, can we go quote ahead. you on this? Can we quote you? This is really good stuff. <laughs> What's that? Can we quote you on this? This is good stuff. Oh, yeah, you can quote me on it. Yeah, I would love if you did. And like I said, that, that raw raw principle is in that book I wrote on the, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, something about prophecy. <laughs> I forget. <laughs> anyway. Um, all right. So the different, this difference of activities in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 there, the difference activities uh, King James Version says different operations. Uh, the, the Jewish Bible calls it different modes of working. Um, NIV calls it the different or varieties of effects, but the same God. Growing in the prophetic. That's what the name of the book was. <laughs> See, I'm into this. I'm not thinking about anything else. All right. So, so here, let me read this to you. 1 Corinthians 12, 6. From the Weiss translation. And it says, and there are different distributions of divine energy motivating these gifts in their operation. But the same God who by his divine energy operates them all in their sphere. Read it again for you. And there are different distributions of divine energy motivating these gifts in their operation but the same god who by his divine energy operates them all in their sphere in their area now what i believe the lord showed me the holy spirit showed me is that these are seen in romans chapter 12 and this is not an exhaustive list of god's gifts and in this category we're talking about the gifts of god in the category of natural gifts, sons and excuse me, sons and daughters of God. So we, we say this person really has a gift of music, or that person's gifted in sports or physical agility. That person might be a gifted in a, a gifted speaker or a gifted orator. Those gifts are gifts from God, but they're called natural gifts. But you you would call them gifts accurately. But you don't have to be a Christian to have an oratory gift, for instance. It can be motivated by a wrong spirit. Hitler, one of his major gifts was his gift of oratory, where he could basically be a Pied Piper to get the masses to follow him. Um, Vladimir Lenin obviously had that too. But they were their their gift was energized by a wrong spirit, not by the originator of the gift. Does that make sense? Now, we're going to look at this in, a, in Romans chapter 12, verse 4, where there are seven gifts listed, and seven being the number for divine perfection, spiritual perfection. So in verse 4, it says, like, oh, let me just back up, just as I want to describe it again, as it, this comes through God's grace also. But it's different. Now, there's different types of grace. There's at least five different kinds of grace. And grace, you know, the number five is the number for grace. So there's common grace or natural grace. Then there's saving grace. There's sanctifying grace. There's empowering grace. And then there's supernatural grace, okay? So this comes in the category, these gifts are in the category of common or natural grace. Common grace or natural grace is favor that God gives to all people. Generally, it is manifested in the way that God takes care of all people, providing for them sunshine, rain, shelter, food, government laws, general health, etc. Common grace extends to every human alive. This includes their personal gifts and abilities, which all of us have as, quote, God-given talent. So this is a category that you would say is God-given talent, all right? And again, this list is not exhaustive, but there's seven, which is the number for spiritual perfection. All right. So.
So I call these the inspirational gifts of God. They work within people. Uh, and they came from heaven through our connection to Adam as sons of God in that sense. Not born again sons, but children of God in that sense. Right? All right. So Romans chapter 12, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and the individual members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that has been given to us. This is not the grace in Ephesians chapter 4. But this is natural grace that's given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry. Let us use it in our ministry. That's the word service, fude. In verse 11, it says, don't be slothful in business. That's the same word, spude, but be fervent in the spirit. So you see, don't be slothful in your business, in your ministry. So if you have a gift of service or ministry, when we use the word ministry, we think of it as in the church. Let's get it out of the church. Yes, we want to use it in the church, but we don't want to limit it to the church. You see what I'm saying? So on service, let us use it for service. Do you, do you know a person, let's say, that's a, very, that's a servant, someone that's very caring, helpful, and even before they were born again, or even as a child, that person just is always helping, always serving. Uh, that, that's in this category of ser someone that has a gift in that area or a long suit in that area. He who teaches in teaching. Now, again, we're not in the category of Ephesians 4 where a person's life was given to the church as a teacher. But remember, Timothy uh, was told by, and Titus were told by Paul, that if you're going to raise up elders for the church, they have to be able to teach. But there's a big difference between able to teach and the gift of teacher. If we require every pastor, quote, to have the gift of teacher, we're going to have a lot fewer pastors in the pulpit because they don't have to be able to teach at the level of a five-fold teacher, but they do have to be able to teach. And this person here has a gift of teaching. Have you ever had a did you ever have a teacher growing up that was really, really good? In, I'm talking about in public school. Someone that just made you listen, that you just you received from. That person may or may not have been born again, but they had a gift of teaching. They weren't maybe they may they may have been the gift of teacher, but they may not have been. They just had a gift of teaching. So they were able to teach, and we need that in the world, but that gift of teaching can be, um, can, what's the word, uh, can we be redeemed or sanctified for the Lord. But not every, I mean, there are people in the dark arts that are gifted teachers. There are people in the new age that are gifted teachers. There are people who have, you know, multi-million dollar, we wouldn't call them ministries, but organizations because they're such gifted teachers, but they're not anointed by the Holy Spirit. But they're using a gift, a natural gift, to draw people into their, their beliefs. Okay, they call them maharajas and they call them gurus in other countries. But they have a gift of teaching. And they get a following. And they teach them the wrong thing <laughs> many times. He who exhorts on exhortation. Have you ever met somebody that's an encourager just naturally? They're just one of those people that is always like, well, don't feel bad. You know, it's going to be better. They're the, they're the cup half full kind of person. And even, even if they're not saved, they're the kind of person you want to talk to when you feel bad. You know, there's sometimes you don't want to talk to a Christian that you know, but you want to go to a non-believer because you know they're going to bind up your wounds because they have that natural gift of encouragement. Now, if you get that person saved and get that gift anointed by the Holy Spirit, it's going to be even better. But there's a natural gift of encouragement. He who gives with liberality. This is someone that's generous. You, there are philanthropists that have a gift of generality. Not all of them are born again. But many, and, and some of them give to wrong causes. But nevertheless, they have this gift of, of being generous. We need to get them born again. <laughs> we need to get them being generous in the church and to the things of God, right? We need to redeem that gift. But that's a natural gift, you see? Um, 
he who leads with diligence. Again, that's the word spude, which is to be a leader or a presider. Are there natural leaders? Yes. There are natural leaders that, I mean, Napoleon was a natural leader. I don't know that he was born again. I don't believe he was. I believe he was energized by wrong spirits, but he was quite a leader. We still study his leadership uh, techniques to this day. His leadership was true. It was used for wrong things, but the things that he taught, that uh, the principles that he taught, we can learn from. Does that make sense? There are true leaders that have true a true gift of leadership, but are Maybe, maybe leading people off a cliff. Then he who shows mercy, do it with cheerfulness or hilarity. So this is a person who has a gift of mercy, has a gift of compassion. There are people like that. Those are the kind of people you want to visit you when you're in the hospital. You don't, you know, I remember Ed Savozo talking about when he was in the hospital and it looked like he might, he might lose his eyesight. And he said the last thing he wanted was for another Christian to come in and tell him he sinned somehow and he had to repent for something. He said, look, I've repented for everything I can think of. But, you know, somebody would come in and pray for him and bless him and just be merciful. That, that you know, healed his heart. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because otherwise he'd done everything he could. I remember him talking about that. Anyway, so, but he, he didn't need someone. So, so let's look at a couple things here. For instance, prophecy. That's the first thing listed. And yet that's, I want to look at that one because it's the only one that's in all three of these categories. 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians chapter 4, and Romans chapter 12. I think that I, when, when the Lord showed me this, I said, Lord, how can this be natural gifts if you've got prophecy here? How can a natural person have prophecy? There's a natural gift of prophecy. In this category, it's someone who has the ability to speak boldly or to see things that are not apparent to others. Have you ever met somebody? In the lunchroom, maybe, or, you know, out when you're doing things, or you've had a friend maybe growing up that was just one of those guys or girls that just spoke boldly, no matter what, everybody else is like being politically correct, and they're like, I'm not putting up with this, and they speak it out, and sometimes you don't want to be around them, sometimes you do, but the point is, is that they're not always positive, sometimes they bring out these words, and they're powerful, but they can also be cutting. They can be harmful. Um, I've been around guys that are in motorcycle group, grand, gangs, you know, and things like that, that, that have this ability to speak boldly and with, with um, perception. But what they speak is not always edifying. But what they're seeing is true. They have an ability to, I'm not talking about all of them, but certain ones of them, but then they'll bring it out and you have to kind of chuckle because it's like it's not coming out. After they get born again, it's not coming out polished but it's still there you see what i'm saying so they bring it out in montana you see that a lot in the government because montanans are pretty famous for telling people what they think they're, what they think is not always redeemed <laughs> but it, but it often comes out in ways that the public official will hear it uh, you know what i'm you know what i'm trying to describe <laughs> it's like anyway <laughs> It's like, it reminds me of uh, the old John Wayne movie. Remember McClintock? I don't know if you ever saw it, but but he he was up there. <laughs> he was he was he was kind of chewing one guy out. He says, you know, you got a real problem, and somebody needs to put you in your place. But it won't be me. It won't be me. Oh hell, it will. <laughs> Sorry, but I had to say that. And he, you know, he started to fight. <laughs> Hey, Lloyd, do we have time for some questions? Because we only got like four minutes now. Okay, yes. So I'll, just, I'll end there. Sorry, I've been having too much fun. So, yes, let's open up for questions. Lloyd, this has been amazing. It's really good. I mean, you, you could unpack this. You could take years to unpack this. And I, you, it's easy to see all the wealth of um, revelation God's given you and everything you've learned over the years. And I just want to thank you right now. This has been very awesome. Um, so let, well, let's go ahead and take questions. What were the questions? Karen, you had a question. Well, I actually, mine's just this um, simple question. In the beginning, you talked about the number nine meaning the spirit, but you also said it meant judgment. Judgment, right. Where you got that from? Well, just biblically, you know, honestly, I don't remember where I got it from. It probably, if you go look at some uh, 
uh, theologians like Bollinger, he probably has it in some of his books, E.W. Bollinger. Uh, it's probably in other theological works, but you can find it in scripture when you look at different things that are numbered in nine, and you'll see the Holy Spirit hiding those things. Um, and you'll see the number uh, it, for spirit, like the gifts of the spirit are nine. There's nine gifts, and that'll help bring true judgment. But it also recognize it represents the, uh, the the gifts, or excuse me, the fruit of the spirit, not the gifts of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit is also nine. So you see that. But judgment also, and we're, we have nine Supreme Court justices. We haven't always had nine, but we have, for most of our history, had nine. And I always wondered if uh, if our early uh, founders uh, understood that number and, and did that for a reason. But, um, but you'll, if you'll look up some of the other theologians, again, off the top of my head, the first one I would look for would be E.W. E. Bullinger, but I'm sure others have it, have it listed in these categories of what those numbers represent. For instance, seven being spiritual perfection, three being complete, five being grace. Uh, those are important numbers. You know, because you can, you can continue on to 13 all the way up to 100 and what was it, Jesus, 153 fish? That, that's a number of the harvest. Hey, so, um, so Lloyd, you did a masterful work on your PhD with five smooth stones. You've got a lot of explanation in some of the things there that we can certainly share the link with everybody as well, if, if that's all right. That's great, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm slowly working on that to get it you know, up to where it can be published, but uh, anyway. It needs to be a workbook because it's really, um, it's, it's amazing. Other questions? So, Lloyd, your other book you mentioned about uh, looking for prophecy or whatever was called. Yeah, yeah. Um, Where is that book available at? Grow, growing in the Prophetic. Actually, uh, just from me right now, actually, at, at this point in time, I, I don't even have it on Amazon anymore. But, uh, um, but I still have plenty of copies. Tell me, or tell me how much it is. I'll buy one. Well, I'll bring a bunch when I come back uh, next month. Okay, great. Well, actually, it's, it'll be May, I guess, when I come back. So I'll bring some. That'd be great. But um, other questions that people had? Um, I just had a similar question. Um, how I live in Australia, so how would I be able to get a copy of your book? Um, you know, I'm sure we can mail it, but, uh, yeah, that'd be the only way to get it, I suppose. I wonder, I don't, you know, I wrote that before we did P PF, PF, PDF, what are those? PDFs, but we can help PDF, you. Yeah. I wonder if I can get it on PDF and do it that way yeah, too. Maybe, maybe, Lloyd, if you bring it here, we can help to get that taken care of. When I could mail you a copy, though, if you if you guys want to do that for me. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, sure, thank you. But if you did, you want to. If you want to do that, I mean, I can see what I got, and then you guys can make it available to everybody that way. Uh, that you would, make it no, I, you know, I get, I get, uh, I only sell them, you know, where I travel now, but I still get blessed by, I just got an email from a guy in Alaska a short time ago. He goes, you know, I get your book. I bought your book years ago and I pull it out every once a year and I reread it and da, 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 da. It makes me happy because it, it's, it's meant to be a, a book that can be referred, a reference book that you can go back. It's not a big book. I don't know if you know who John Moore is. John Moore is a Christian writer and an author and cowboy. And he told me he's very prophetic and, he told me one time, he says, it was the best small book on prophecy he'd ever read. So, so that may be. Well, Lloyd, if we get it in digital, we can certainly help you with that. Um, okay. Michael, question. Michael, go ahead. Okay, in Ephesians 4, I was wondering, is um, everyone in the body of Christ, will each, will, will they have that function of an apostle, function of a prophet, so on and so on? Yeah, some people teach that everybody has one of the five gifts. I don't believe that. I haven't seen that. But I do believe that as the church becomes apostolic, all the people will become apostolic. I do believe that as the church becomes more prophetic and allows the prophets and receives the prophets, the people will receive the prophets' reward. and They'll become more prophetic. I believe that if we have true shepherds that are truly shepherding, they're going to equip the saints to shepherd. And I like it when we don't. I like it when there are shepherds in the body that are functioning at such a level. We're not quite sure if they're five-fold level. Mean, that means we're doing a good job. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I, yeah. I have a lot of folks around me that people think are prophets or apostles, but they're just getting the anointing. They're not necessarily having the gift, but they're, they're walking in that because they have been around it. So they're, And I believe that as we have 
true apostolic ministry functioning in the church, the church will become apostolic. The early church was apostolic in the sense that everybody considered themselves to be a sent one or an ambassador. It didn't mean everybody was a had their life given to the church as a gift, but everybody had that apostolic spirit of, of recognizing that they were called and sent as ambassadors. So therefore, the church was apostolic. And I like it when we're doing such a good job at the fivefold level that sometimes the people that we're ministering to get confused that maybe they're they're walking in a gift that they're not. But that's a that's a good problem. Okay, so Michael, that you're done. Uh, Femi had a question. Femi said, "Why don't we all speak in tongues?" Well, part of it is I think we're not taught that we can and should. I. <laughs> When I, I went to Baptist school for college at first, and I'd never, growing up a Baptist, I'd never heard of the gifts of the Spirit. I hadn't even heard that they had died with the apostles. I'd just never, I'd never heard the word Pentecost. When I got to school, I started hearing about gifts because I was interested in these things of God and power and so on. And I remember my friend that uh, was in seminary told me his definition of, of uh, tongues, and, and I never forgot it. He said, he said, well, the gifts of tongues is a gift that certain people have and certain people don't. And the ones that have it always get puffed up in pr with pride and they always hold it against the others and it always splits the church. And that was his definition of tongues. So I remember saying, oh, well, I would never want that. You know, but eight months later, I was speaking in tongues. You know why? Because I was hungry for God and he led me there. I did, you know, in other words, before I knew it was possible, I didn't speak in tongues and I didn't know it was possible. I have to know what's available before I can receive it. Once I once I found out was what was available, um, it wasn't too long after that that I, I received it. Now there can be other things too. There can be blocks. There can be things that we've learned that block it. There can be spiritual things that block it. I remember a woman that one time that um, she had real discernment at times, but she could never speak in tongues. She never got filled with the Holy Spirit. And this was before caller ID. And you'd call her, uh, and, and, and she'd answer the phone, and she said, oh, hi, Lloyd, or hi, you know, Bill, or hi, uh, Michael, or whatever. And, and you say, how did you know it was me? Well, I just always know these things. And one time we discerned that wasn't the Holy Spirit. That was something she had before she was born again. It was a, it was a familiar spirit. Once she cast out the familiar spirit, well, she couldn't uh, do the caller ID anymore, but she spoke in tongues. After that. There was a demon that was holding back that gift of the spirit. So now we have caller ID. We don't need that familiar spirit anyway. But uh, you see the difference? Sometimes we can have things that block us from receiving, even though we're born again. Well, that's, that's really very powerful. We really need to, to know and hear about that. Um, David has a question. And before David gets in there, uh, Casey says, Bob Jones said that we're all called to at least one, but may, but may not chosen to an office. But may have what? Uh, we may all be called to at least one gift, but we're not chosen for that office necessarily. Okay. Okay. Not chosen for the office. Yeah. Many people call the five gifts in Ephesians offices. Yeah. Not biblically used, but I, I don't mind using that term just to set it apart from the gifts of the Holy Spirit versus the offices of the five gifts. Right. Okay. And, so and again, uh, again, if we have true evangelists in the body of Christ, the church itself will become evangelistic. David, you had a question. Yes. Um, in First Corinthians chapter 12, verse, the last verse, uh, but honestly desire and strive for the greater gifts, and yet I will show you a still more excellent way. And then the Paul wrote about love in the next chapter. So we all know that love is a fruit of the Spirit, but can we say love also is a spiritual gift? Because he wrote about a, it's a st uh, he will show for the still more excellent way. Is it a more excellent spiritual gift? Can we call it a charisma? Yeah. Well, he doesn't call it a charisma, but if you want to call it a way, you could. <laughs> yeah. You know, but I, I know definitely there are people who walk that are gifted in love and releasing love. I, I have no problem with, with that. Um, what I want you to understand real quickly, if I can just quickly say this, again, um, 
Paul was a Jew, and he often uh, put Jewish teachings into his teachings that may be hidden to us that we can see by the Holy Spirit. And if you'll took, look at 1 Corinthians 12, gifts, 1 Corinthians 13, fruit, that's love, fruit, 1 Corinthians 14, gift. So you have gift, fruit, gift. And then he says, if I have if I if I have all these gifts but don't have love, I'm a sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. If you remember, the hem of the garment of the high priest had a pomegranate and a bell, and a pomegranate and a bell, and a pomegranate and a bell. That represents the fruit and the gift, and the fruit and the gift, and the fruit and the gift. And if you didn't have the fruit between the bells, if you didn't have the pomegranate between the bells, the bells would cling on one another. And so when Paul said, I would be a sounding brass or a tingling symbol, he was giving the, the uh, image of the high priest's uh, garment without the fruit. And so we are sounding brass and a tingling symbol, but we don't have the fruit. So what he did there with those three chapters, he put a fruit and a gift and a fruit, excuse me, a gift and a fruit and a gift as a symbol, symbol of the high priest's um, uh, hem, which is where Jesus got touched. Remember, Malachi says that there'll be healing in his hem, which is the word wings. Uh, there'll be healing in his wings. And when that woman recognized Jesus as the high priest, she realized, I need to touch the hem of his garment. Now, he didn't have a pomegranate or a bell, as far as I know. Maybe he did have the sewn on there. But she touched the hem, and she got the fruit, which was the gift of healing, you see. Uh, but when he said that, he's he's this. He's, he's differentiating the gifts from the fruit so we, he would understand we need both. Here, I had to learn this the hard way. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. So I would get around a minister who had, let's say, gifts of healing and miracles. And I'd get around that person because I wanted to see the gifts of healing and miracles. And I'd think, wow, this is a true ministry. And guess what? I'd get burned. I'd get taken advantage of. i get, especially early in ministry, you know, people abused me and, and took advantage of me, uh, would abuse my gifts, you know, would draw them after themselves. And I would go back to the Lord and say, wait a minute, what's going on here, Lord? And the Lord taught me there's a difference between the fruit of the ministry and the fruit of the minister. I was judging the fruit of the ministry, which was gifts of healing, miracles, teaching, sometimes great teaching, sometimes... But I was missing the fruit of the minister, which is supposed to be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, temperance. And that was missing. And once I recognized I needed to differentiate the gifts, uh, the fruit of the ministry and the fruit of the minister, I no longer was taken advantage of. I no longer was abused. I could receive the gifts of healing or miracles, but I would not allow myself to come under that person because they did not walk in love. You see what I'm saying? They were abusive. And that, that may explain things to some of you. Maybe you've had those experiences too. So that so so love is a fruit of the spirit. And certainly people may be gifted in love or gifted in, let's say, uh, uh, temperance or gifted in patience, but that is not a gift. It's it's a fruit. Very good point. That's, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Sometimes you can teach just on that, you know, on those two things. <laughs> you, the, you could, there's a lot. This is very rich. We'll it's, send the uh, copy of the video to everybody yeah. so you can study again. I know I want to listen to it again. So thank you so much, Lloyd. Are there any other last minute questions? And then we need to pray for thank David. David. Uh, you may have uh, bronchitis or symptoms like that. And we can pray for Lloyd. And Lloyd, too. Oh, I'd love it. Of course, if the Holy Spirit's telling you, right, Lloyd? <laughs> ah, I would love it. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Father God, we just ask for our dear David, Joy, in Myanmar, Burma, Lord, for a touch of your love. Mm -hmm. Father, your arm is not too short to reach down from the very uh, throne room of God to touch him and permeate every cell in his being, all 30 trillion cells alive and illuminated with your light and your truth and your love and your joy and all the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And Jesus, you are our healer, Jehovah Rapha, by your stripes.
He's healed, and we just command any sickness, uh, phlegm, congestion, infection to go now. It has no right, no legal authority, no license to be in his body, and we command it to go back to the pit of hell where it came from and leave him and never return again. And we thank you for the honey healing balm of, of oil from your Holy Spirit and from heaven to come through the second heavens into this dimension in his body in Jesus' name. And we just thank you for that heat flowing through him and that oil flowing through him and the royal blood in his veins being healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We just, we just um, if anybody has words for David, um, you're welcome to go ahead and text this to him because, um, you know, if it, anything you want to send to him, please let him know. You're, uh, feel free to do that. Anybody have anything for David? <laughs> 